I just want to mention again. Yeah, I just want to mention again that um, I will be going to the Baal Shem Tov in a couple of weeks. Anyone who has a request or a prayer or uh, something that they would like to share with the founder of the Hasidic path, uh, I'd be happy to take a letter or an email or whatever it is with me and deposit it there or uh, read it if you want me to read it there. Traditionally, the a person's request is actually read at the graveside. That's the way it's usually done. But if it's private information that you don't want anyone else to know, you could just let me know. And I will send it um, incognito. I will leave it there incognito. No one will read it. And so on. That's how it goes. Um, that is going to be uh, in a couple of weeks. So I'll let you know closer to the time. But uh, the sooner you get your messages in, the better it will be probably that well or printed them and have them ready and so on <clears throat> okay um another thing i wanted to mention that is <clears throat> everybody's using the same text more or less at least uh, that's the way it was planned uh this is a text which um one of the people in this uh in this in this call in this uh, group uh had on their computer and they shared with us very kindly as a PDF. Um, although I'm not teaching directly, I'm only reading the English translation of the Mishnah in Sefer Yitzira. I'll read the original Hebrew and then the translation. Uh, sometimes translated slightly differently, but it doesn't matter. <clears throat> but the text that's over there, I'm not teaching since you have it in writing. And it's well worth looking at. The author of the, of the commentary is Rabbi Arya Kaplan, uh, Shalom, of blessed memory. And uh, he was a very great <clears throat> sage and had the ability to put things into words, which um, many other people found much more difficult. So it's worth reading his commentary besides listening to, to, uh, to this one. His commentary is based in general on the classical commentaries. I tried to go a little bit beyond <clears throat> just the classical commentaries to understand the concepts a little bit better because the simple translation of the words and even the explanation of the classical commentaries do not always capture the essence of what is going on here. Okay, so having said that, I think it's time to begin. We are on um, in the first chapter, the fourth Mishnah, which is on page 38 in the original text. Let me just get my text up on the screen so that you can see it. And for those of you who do not have a text in front of you, oh, I have to share. One second, I'm sorry. Um, share, share screen. Okay, here we go. Share screen. Uh, here we go. All right. I'm assuming everyone can see this. <clears throat> we start off at the top, uh, the top of the page here. Yeah. Esses Firot Belima. The tenth Firot of no substance or the tenth Firot of nothingness. I'll explain all these words. I just want to read and translate it first. And then we'll um, go into the explanation, longer explanation afterwards. Eser velotesha. There are 10 and not 9. Oops. 10 and not 9. 10 and not 11. Eser velotesha. Eser velotesha. 10 and not 9. 10 and not 11. Now, why is that important? We'll see later on. Um, why this is important to note that there are only 10 Svirot. Now, when we say that there are only 10 Svirot, there are only 10 Svirot in each of the planes of existence. As we've explained on numerous occasions, there are several planes of existence. The mundane, the most mundane plane of existence spoken about in the Kabbalah is the world of Asiya. And then beyond that, there's the world of Yetzirah, the world of formation. The first world is the world of action, and the physical world in which we live is the lowest aspect thereof, of the world of action. <clears throat> then there's the world of formation, which is called Sefer Yitzira, and then the world of creation, 
of coming into being called Olam Abriya, the world of Abriya. And then there's the world of Atsilut, the world of closeness, the world of divine manifestation, essentially, which is called Atsilut, closeness, from the word Eitzel, meaning close. Then there are transcendent worlds. The world of Aram Kadmon is a transcendent world. Then there's beyond any world. Every world in Kabbalah, even the very highest of the worlds, the world of Aram Kadmon, comes about through a process of concealment. That process of concealment is called the Tzimtzum, a very famous doctrine in the writings of the Arizal, explained at great length in the Arizal and um, in the Hasidic teachings um, that, uh, that expound on this idea uh, tremendously. In any event, there are 10 Sfirot in each of those worlds. So when we say the 10 Sfirot, it depends on which world we're talking about. But um, each of the worlds has 10 Sfirot. <clears throat> okay, and that's the inner structure of the world, and we'll discuss that uh, shortly. So these worlds are, sorry, these, uh, these Sfirot are 10, not 9, 10, not 11. And then he goes on to explain that they're not 10 completely separate powers. There are 10 powers, 10 manifestations, 10 um, sfirot, they call the sfirot, the 10 powers or the 10 sfirot are intertwined one with, with another. And they intertwine in such a way that the higher sfirot are inseparable from each other. And he brings an example of that. The first example of that is called Havain Bechochma, that's Bina within Chochma. I will show you a um, chart of this shortly. We'll discuss it that way. But Havain Bechochma, Bina within Chochma. Bina and Chochma are the two highest of the manifested Sfirot. There are uh, 10 Sfirot. The highest Sfirot is Keter, but that's a transcendent Sfirot. The first of the manifest Sfirot is Chochma. And the second one is Bina. And within Chochmah, you have Bina. And within Bina, you have Chochmah. Havein bechochmah v'chachem bebina. Yeah, you have Bina in Chochmah and Chochmah in Bina. <coughs> Why is this important? Because uh, in the world of Tohu, you did not have this intermingling, what is actually essentially called in Kabbalah, Hitkalalut. Hitkalalut means... Uh, one co is comprised of the other. They're, they're interlaced in a sense. Actually, interlaced is probably not the right word, but they're inter, um, um, uh, interactive, inter integrated. I think that's the word. They are integrated one with the other. Very important thing to know because this is exactly the opposite of the world of Tohu. The world of Tohu, there were the, the 10 spheres of the world of Tohu, seven of them fell apart. They broke apart. And why did they break apart? Because they were disparate. They were separated one from another. They did not have each other to support each other, an important concept in its own right. But we'll talk about that perhaps later on. Let's just continue explaining the Mishnah. Bechon Bahem, probe them, examine them. Bechon Bahem, sorry, Bechon, the word Bechonia, Bechon Bahem, Vechakor Mehem probe them and examine them, or examine them and probe them as the way he has it over here. And set everything up in its proper manner, in the proper way of understanding it. Make each one clear in and of itself. And this is part of the process of Tikkun, after the falling apart of the world of Tohu, and the world of Tikkun, the world of rectification. And part of the rectification of the chaos of the world of Tohu and the falling apart of the world of Tohu is that everything has its proper place. Everything has its proper place. Everything has its proper time. Its proper place is associated with the six spherot of Zer Anpin. Those are the ones that broke apart. And the sphera of Malchut, which also broke apart. The six spherot of Zer and Pin are the six Firot of space that define space. Because six Firot are the six sides of space, up and down, left and right, front and back. Of course, the Firot have their names, Chesed, Guru, Tiferet, and Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, Yesod. But that's how it works. Up and down, right and left, front and back. That defines the six Firot of space, the six dimensions of space. And there's a dimension of time, which is the Sphira of Malchut. Malchut defines 
time. Now, Malchut is a feminine sphira, and just to make a joke at the expense of the ladies over here, don't take it personally, please. But that's possibly why some of the ladies find it much harder to keep time. In fact, it's true, because time is a sphere of Malchut. They're living within Malchut, and therefore they don't see it as a, they don't experience Malchut as something outside of themselves, as something inside of themselves, since they are the female component, the female element. And when a person lives in the female element, they can't see it properly. Now, of course, this is not necessarily true of every, um, of every lady, uh, but um, I guess the standard uh, male joke is that um, ladies have a much harder time than men keeping time. I'm just looking for comments over here, and so far I don't see anyone throwing any rotten apples at me, so we're still good. Okay, so how is it that the sphira of Malchut is associated with time? Because there's a verse that says, Melech, Malach, Yimloch. Melech, he is king. Malach, he was king. Yimloch, he will be king. Past, present, future, or present, past, future, right? That's what defines time present, past, and future, and that is the function of Malchus, uh, or Malchut is defined time. I'll explain a little bit more uh, later on how Malchut defines time. In any event, each thing has to stand clearly in its proper place, in its proper time, and that, 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 that brings, when things are in their proper place, in their proper time, that Vahashev Yotor Yoter al that brings the creator to sit on his proper place, on his base, on his throne, on his however you want to call it, al in the proper place where he wanted to be initially. What does that mean? That there's a midrashic rabbinic literature, rabbinic explanation that it says God wanted a dwelling place in the lower world why did he create the low world in the first place he didn't have to create the low world there was no necessity he did that because he wanted godliness to be revealed in the lower worlds just as it is in the, just as it is in the higher worlds and in order for that to happen that had to come about through man and when I say man I mean men and women obviously doing their proper thing in the proper time, in the proper manner, in order to make the world into a holy abode for the divine, or the holy abode for God. Okay, that is the basic setup, basic understanding of the, um, of the mission, the basic understanding. Let's get into a little bit more now, but I'm going to call up over here. I want to conjure up... <laughs> I'm just going to bring up as a, can everyone see, um, can everyone see this um, chart of the Svirot? Let me just see in the chat that you're saying yes or no. Please uh, tell me in the chat if you can see the chart of the Svirot. Um, yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, very good. <coughs> okay, here's the chart of the Svirot. Now, if you look carefully, and you count up all the spherot, let me just make it a little bit smaller so you can see all of them at once. If you count up all the spherot here, you will see that in fact there are 11 spherot over here, because we have, all right, let's count it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, right? Why is that? Because in order for the chart to be complete, we put both Keter and Da'at. Now, in reality, Keter and Dat, Keter and Dat are not counted as two Svirot, because if you count Keter, you don't count Dat. If you count Dat, you don't count Keter. What is the idea? The idea is whether you count the transcendent aspect or you're looking more at the imminent aspects. The imminent aspects are comprised of these Tens we wrote here. Oops, these tens we wrote here, including that. But when we talk about transcendent, the transcendent aspect being included in the sphere, then we don't count that, but we count Keter instead, right? Because Keter is a transcendent sphere. Okay. Now, where are we going with this? First of all, <clears throat> we explained in a previous class that when we talk about the Svirot, we could possibly mean two things. <clears throat> when we say that the Svirot are blima, 
without any character, which is what we just said, that don't have in the, 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 the spherot of nothingness. We're talking essentially about the light of the spherot. It's the light of the spherot that does not have any form. But the vessel of the sphira does have a form. And the names of the spherot, as we have them over here, Keter, Chochma, Bina, and so on and so forth, all the spherot, all the way through to Malchut, all of them, when we talk about the name of the sphira, we're talking about the Kli, the vessel of the sphira. So there's a light and there's a vessel. Or if you want to put it this way, there's an energy. And there's a finitude, a finite aspect to that energy. There is where that energy is directed to or what type of energy it is and therefore what it will be directed to, what it will perform, what, 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 it's, what its function is. And that's called the light within the vessel. Now, when we talk about the, the 10 spherot of nothingness, Eres spherot blima, the Eres spherot, the 10 spherot, which have no character, have no um, definable composition, we mean the spherot only as they are the supernal aspects of light. I think I mentioned last time or in the, in the previous class that in this particular matter, there is a disagreement between the Arizal Rabbi Yitzhak Luria and an earlier sage named the Ramak, the Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. Rabbi Moshe Cordovero was the leading Kabbalist of his generation. And he was, he, as he, uh, uh, a short time before he passed away, the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, became very ascendant in the city of Safa and of Svat. And he sort of took over the leadership and introduced a whole new dimension into Kabbalah. So the classical dimension of Kabbalah is explained by Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. So Rabbi Moshe Cordovero put it like this. He said that the Sfirot are essentially the vessels <coughs> and the lights within the spherot are all the same light. And he gave an analogy. He said the analogy as follows. He said, if you take water from a lake, from a lake, from a river, whatever, right? And you pour water into various colored vessels, the water appears to be, appears to take on the color of the vessel into which it's poured. If it's a blue vessel, so the water looks blue, especially if it's a transparent vessel. If it's a red vessel, uh, the, 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 the water looks red. Now, if you pour the water out again, you'll see that the water does not have any color of its own. And that's how he explained the concept of the lights, which don't have any character or quality. Only when they come into vessels, do they appear to take upon themselves the quality of the vessels. Darizal disagreed with this. <clears throat> Darizal explained that the light that comes into any particular vessel is already, um, I can't think of the right word. I was going to say geared to, but that's not really the right word. It's already um, characterized, let's put it that way. It's already characterized for that particular vessel. Let's give an, uh, an analogy from a more human perspective that we can understand. <clears throat> Every uh, human being, obviously is comprised of what we would call body and soul or body and consciousness, if you prefer to use the term consciousness. Now, the soul, let's just use the classical terminology, the soul of a particular person isn't just a soul that just went into this body by chance rather than any other body. And the, the reason that the soul went into this particular body is that it has to have, it has to do certain tikkunim, the certain functions and things that it has to do in this world that would otherwise not be able to be performed. So it's not just that the soul goes into the first body that's available, like the water would go into the first vessel available. It doesn't work like that. It's specifically designed to go into that particular body so they can work together to achieve a certain result. The Arizal here was pointing out that things are calculated from the outset. What does it mean calculated from the outside? Configured is a good word, yeah. Configured, configured is a good word. Um, things are, 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 yeah, configured from the outset so that certain actions can be done in the world. Does it mean that they will be done? Not necessarily, hopefully they'll be done, but not necessarily. It's just that there's a potential now for that to be, for that to be the case. So Arizal argued 
that the lights are already to a certain, extent, a certain extent configured according to those particular vessels. Along comes the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov says, it's not just that the lights are configured to those particular vessels, those lights are configured to those particular vessels for a certain purpose, for, an, for, for, for a transcendent purpose. Now, I'm not going to get into that uh, particular thing now because it's going to veer off the subject, but just be aware that that is uh, what the idea is. Therefore, the Arizal can come along and explain to us. <clears throat> the Arizal comes along to explain to us that this concept in Sefer Yitzira of what we see next. What do we see next? Uh, that, where are we? Um, new share, one second. Let me just get back to... Get back to where we were. Where were we now? Uh, all right, I'll have to stop share and then share again. Sorry about that. Uh, I want to get back to the um, to the Safi Yitzira. Uh, okay, so here we go here. A little complicated this uh, business. <clears throat> here we go. Okay, <clears throat> here comes the, the result to, to, to explain to us now why it is that we have, what I mentioned was hit kalalut, the intermingling of the svirot. How could it be intermingling of the svirot according to the remark? It would only be intermingling of the vessels, but not intermingling of the lights. But according to the result, we understand very well. <clears throat> it's not only that the Svirot, the vessels of the Svirot, have aspects of each other within them, but even the lights have aspects of each other within them. And that's in fact the way it's supposed to be because the proper tiku and the proper rectification is that everything should be working in some common kind of harmonious unity so that they're all together performing their duties and performing their, their functions as one whole, as one, uh, as one whole complete entity. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, we're going to say over here, we're going to say 10 and not nine. Why are we saying 10 and not nine and 10 and not 11? First of all, 10 and not nine. We might think that the 10 imminent Svirot, we would only count nine of them because the final Svirah, the Svirah of Malchut, doesn't really have, the Zohar says about the final Svirah, about Malchut, late la migar ma klum, she has nothing of her own. Malchut does not have anything of its own, just like the moon, Malchut is always compared to the moon, and the moon does not have any light of its own, it only has the light that is, that shines Onto it from the from the sun, right? The light of the moon is not its own light; it's the light of the sun. Now, um, does that have to be the case? According to the Kabbalistic texts, this was not not this was in fact not always the case. The moon at one point in time did have light of its own. Now, I'm not going to go into it from the scientific point of view whether the moon was actually a, um, a, a luminary or it wasn't a luminary. That's not the point. The point here is to talk about the concept. The concept of Malchut is that Malchut was once itself a luminary. Whether the moon or not the moon doesn't matter. But Malchut was a luminary. <coughs> and um, for various reasons, which we don't need to go into now, it was not appropriate that there should be two luminaries doing the same thing. Therefore, one became a luminary and one became the receiver of the illumination from the other. Now, this is actually something that's repeated in human existence as well. Um, in other words, just as the moon has no light of its own, but gets its light from the sun, so too in human experience, the student, the uh, novice, the novice student absorbs from his teacher 
from his or her teacher, obviously, without having anything of their own to start off with. As things build up and as they continue to build up and so on and so forth, eventually the sphere of Malchut does get its own light. But to such an extent does it get its own light that it becomes the luminary of the next world down. The Keter of the higher, sorry, the Malchut of the higher world becomes the Keter of the next world down. So Malchut, once it's been, um, what's the word, educated, once it's been illuminated by the higher Sfirot, by the, by the upper Sfirot, now has the ability to illuminate as well. Where does it illuminate? It illuminates in the next level down. And that's how the light comes, in fact, from the highest levels to the lowest levels. That was the process that, uh, that, that God wanted in order for there to be illumination in the lower world as well. So that's why we might think that, uh, that Malchut should not be counted, because Malchut descends to the next world down. So for two reasons, Malchut might not be counted. One, in, its, in the beginning, it doesn't have any light of its own. In, in the upper world, it doesn't have any light of its own. It's only receiving light from the other sphere. Right? And two, when it does have light, it descends into the world below. And therefore, you might think that it's not part of this world. And therefore, there should only be nine sphere. Right? Nine sphere right because it illuminates the next world. And in this world, it doesn't have any light of its own. So we are told, no, that's not the case. Receiving is part of the whole picture. It's not that receiving when one has nothing of one's own is a, um, how do you say it in, um, in Hebrew? It's called B'dievet case, B'dievet. B'dievet means, or B'dievet means um, there's no other choice. So automatically it's kind of like that. Well, there's no other choice. No, it's not a, there's no other choice. <laughs> if you're talking about God here, he could have made any choice he wanted. It's that, it's designed like that. The system is designed this way. And it's designed this way because that is how the divine wanted things to be. That there should always be a case of a mashpia and a makabo, a giver and a receiver. The, um, in fact, the, uh, the, um, the sages explain that that is in fact part of the concept of charity. The concept of charity is not only that there's a giver, someone giving the charity, but there's also someone receiving the charity. And in Jewish thought, the receiver is no less important than the giver. <clears throat> it's not the receiver is simply uh, a, a, a sort of an empty vessel just and doing nothing. The receiver is part of the, the mitzvah, the commandment of charity. Without a receiver, there wouldn't be the possibility of charity. Similarly, without the receiver, there wouldn't be a possibility of giving light from above. There has to be something receiving it. So it's part of the picture. And therefore, you have to count that it's 10 and not 9. But also 10 and not 11. Why 10 and not 11? <coughs> oh, what's going on? 10 and not 11, because you might think that the transcendent sphera of Keter should also be counted within the scheme of the 10 spherot. And the answer is not if you're counting all 10 spherot. If you're counting all 10 spherot, then you're counting the imminent aspects. You're not counting the transcendent. And the transcendent remains aloof when you count the 10 spherot as the imminent one, as imminent spherot. Therefore, it's 10, not 11. We cannot count the, um, the original, um, let's call it the original inspiration as part of the process. It stands outside of the process. It continues to inform the process. It always does. But nevertheless, it is part of the, um, it's not a part of the process. It stands outside thereof. <clears throat> Uh, okay, let's have uh, some, let's address some, some questions if there are any. Uh, there don't seem to be any questions right now. Uh, okay, folks, shoot, ask some questions if you want. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to uh, continue for a little bit longer. 
what is the word after 11? Uh, understand with wisdom. Um, is that what you mean? Understand with wisdom. Yeah, Havain. Havain Bechokma, you understand with wisdom. All right, <clears throat> understand with wisdom. So, um, all right, so let's let's talk a little bit about the uh, a little bit more about this concept of what's called hit kalalut, understand with wisdom and be wise with understanding. See, if the Svirot were just doing their thing, each Svira was going to do their thing, each Svira was going to do its thing. Uh, there's another question more about why not 11 more about why not 11 yeah again <clears throat> um when we talk okay why why not 11 because when we're talking about within the system within the system of uh, of the spherot in other words within the imminent spherot so we're talking about a certain um process we're talking about process Whereas when we, if we would include Keter within that process, Keter has been the transcendence Vira, Keter is the reason behind the process, but it's not part of the process. Re the reason for the process is not part of the process, stands outside of it. And therefore the process is moving towards Keter. It's moving towards it, but it's not part of it. <clears throat> okay, is that, uh, is that clear? Should I give an... Uh, Speak about the proper healthy beneficial way to use each sphere at some point. Yes, um, that is going to be in a somewhat later class when we go into the into the sphere as the powers of the soul. Um, but we will, yes, we will speak about that at, uh, at some point. <clears throat> okay. I know a lot of it is, uh, is quite abstract uh, at this point in time. Um, Things will become, I think, a little bit clearer as we move further on in, uh, in Sefi Yitzira. We're just sort of understanding the way things are set up. Now, why is it that there are Svirot in the first place? Why do we need Svirot? Why, or not why do we, why did the creator need Svirot? Why did he set things up in this particular way that there are Svirot? And the answer is that this is part of order. In order to have a universe that is well ordered. It is. His, it was his desire. It was his intention that there should be these ten dimensions. If you um, if you have a look at earlier um, mathematical, early mathematical. I'm not a mathematician, not by the longest shot you could possibly imagine. But <clears throat> I've heard this from people who are mathematicians that there were other mathematical systems that did not work on the decimal system. And they were extremely complicated. Had they simply um, based it on the decimal system, in other words, on the, on the system of the 10 spherot, things would have been a lot simpler, right? The mathematics of it would have been a lot simpler and a lot more easy to calculate. So we see that in physical terms, in, in terms, you know, just uh, ordinary material terms, 10 is in itself, in and of itself, an important number, but it's not just an important number. It happens to be a whole number, complete number. It's complete in the sense that it has all aspects. So why, why does it have all aspects? Who said that there shouldn't be eight or, um, or 12 or 13 or whatever it is as a base? Well, um, try and do calculations based on, uh, you know, based on 13 as your base or based on 11 as your base or something, it's much, much more, more, more difficult, obviously. The same thing is true when we want an ordered universe. God wanted the universe to be, to, to develop in an orderly way. And therefore, the spherot were manif manifested in an orderly way. The truth is, as we mentioned in the beginning, in the world of Tohu, it was not like that. The world of Tohu was essentially a base seven system. In other words, there were seven spherot, although there were 10 spherot in the world of Tohu as well. The first three spherot had no influence on the bottom seven spherot, and therefore the bottom seven spherot essentially fell apart. They, they exploded, they, they, uh, they died, uh, as the expression is in, uh, in Kabbalah. They, uh, they just fell apart, they exploded, disintegrated. Why? Because a system that doesn't have um, 
any any system to it. It's chaos. It's chaotic. It's um, just basic points that have no uh, integration between them. That's how things fall apart. Where do things stand, and where do they stand? How do they stand strong? Things stand strong not when not when they're in a single column, but when they're in the three columns. The three columns of the Sfirot, as we know, the, the Sfirot are arranged in columns. The Sfirot of Tohu are not arranged in columns; they were arranged in a single column. There's not three columns of the Sfirot of Tohu, and therefore, for the top Sfira to influence the bottom Sfira was impossible because it had to go through all the in between. It's like a politician, you know. To, get, to trying to get to the politician to, to, to listen to you, whatever it is, he's got all these gateways and, uh, you know, which, which you can't really get through in order to be able to talk to him as, you know, person to person. <clears throat> same, same thing is true with the Sfirot of the world of Tohu. Each was doing its own thing, and each Sfira was a barrier to the one above it, right? It formed a barrier to the one above it. Uh, <clears throat> and therefore, there was, no, there was no dialogue, so to speak. There was no what's called a do siach in Hebrew. There was no dialogue, right? There was no dialogue between the uh, between the Svirot, where which is not true of the Svira of uh, the Svirot of the world of Tikkun. The Svirot of the world of Tikkun are placed into three columns, and those three columns intermediate between the three of them. That's why one of the reasons why a Beit Din, a rabbinical court, is required to be for certain judgments required to have three judges minimum. Right, three judges minimum. Why? Because you get two opinions and the third one between them. In other words, if you have only two judges, they could argue with each other and never come to a resolution. The third always tries to bring a resolution between the first two. Now, we see this um, uh, explained in uh, the Talmud uh, on many, many occasions, but suffice it to say that we see how this works in uh, essentially in our own lives. If you see it, for instance, a seesaw, right? How does a seesaw operate? A seesaw only operates, there might be a right side to the seesaw on the left side to the seesaw, or a scale for that matter, but there's a middle column on which it balances. The whole thing balances on, the, on that middle column and therefore it can always come to some kind of re resolution between the two, uh, between the two sides thereof. So since the Svirot is set up in such a way that <coughs> they, provide balance, they provide resolution, they provide uh, harmony, that is what the world of Tikkun is all about. And that did not happen in the world of Tohu. Therefore, we come to, uh, again, on this concept of understand with wisdom. Understanding and wisdom are two separate sfirot, right? The sphere of Bina and the sphere of Chochmah, wisdom, Chochmah, understanding, Bina. So when understanding is with wisdom, in other words, it's within wisdom, and when wisdom is with understanding, in other words, there's understanding within wisdom and there's wisdom within understanding, they're working together. In other words, if you want to talk, talk about it in terms of human experience more, the, in terms of human, human experience, the idea of wisdom is, let's call it a flash of insight, the flash of insight. The flash of insight has to be built into a composite whole. It has to be explained in all of its parts. It can't just remain. A, an abstract idea it has to be built into a proper uh, application so that's the understanding within wisdom when that flash of insight of wisdom is then built into a let's say into a theory or into a system right then the wisdom can be applied otherwise the wisdom is on its own simply with understanding simply understanding on its own without the inspiration and the insight and the uh, the enlightenment of wisdom also doesn't work just to have understanding we have plenty of people understanding in colleges but they don't have much wisdom uh, now if anyone here is a college professor my apologies to you but you probably know what i'm talking about better than those who are not in college uh, who are not college professors in any event that's how it works let me just see some of the questions over here um is this related to string theory <coughs> There are um, a number of uh, rabbis who have discussed this idea. One of them is Rabbi Ginsberg, Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsberg. Um, he has a website called Gal Enai, G A L E I N A I, Gal Enai. If you look up Gal Enai and then put in the search term string theory, he has a few lectures on it, and um, you will see how he explains the connection between 
string theory and uh, and Kabbalah, very interesting stuff. Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsburg was one of my teachers actually um, in when, when when I lived in Israel as a, as a student and subsequently, uh, and we still keep in touch <clears throat> um, to some extent anyway. <clears throat> Is there any relevance at all to the others we wrote? To thinking of relative but beyond relative, uh, like saying that was beyond order, give right to all order, but beyond order is not chaotic, but beyond all case, beyond any and all continuum. Uh, if I understand what you're saying, Terry, um, yes, that is correct. Um, the idea of um, the idea of chokhmah, chokhmah itself is something, the word chokhmah uh, is the um, Tikkun Zohar. Tikkun Zohar is one of the works of the Zohar. It explains that the word chokhmah can be, can be divided into two, um, two words, koach ma, the power of nothingness or the power of being undefined. Chokhmah is the power of being undefined. And that in itself is to a certain extent, the power of being undefined is to a certain extent, it's a limitation. Um, to be undefined is a wonderful thing, but it's limited in the sense that it cannot, what is undefined cannot um, influence or affect the world. In order to affect the world, it has to be defined. That's the function of Bina. In order for Bina to be inspirational, it has to have Chokhmah. That's the concept that we're explaining now. Understand with wisdom and be wise with understanding. Um, if I understood your question correctly. Uh, tends to be the Kabbalistic atom. On earth, everything is made from this. Um, I don't know if Kabbalistic atom or Kabbalistic mo molecule is more the right... Uh, the right word. <clears throat> in fact, I'm not even sure that I would use the word molecule. Yeah, maybe molecule would probably be a better way to say it, or uh, simply DNA. It's the you know if, if we're talking about a living creature, obviously things that are not living don't have DNA. I don't think rocks have DNA, but um, but anything alive has some kind of DNA sequence to it. I think. I'm not sure about plants, but certainly I think they do, but I'm not sure. But certainly animals, living creatures uh, like animals and so on, and, and of course human beings have a DNA structure. The tenth, the tenth we wrote is more like the DNA structure because there's uh, the way the way the human DNA uh, works with uh, 26 chromosomes and so on and so forth, and there's two strands, uh, is, is very um, close to the way this we wrote in the binding or the two strands together would be by the middle column and so on and so forth. In any event, yes, it's an analogy that, that could be uh, could be used. King Solomon was wise. He said he was uh, the wisest man uh, who ever lived. But um, he, was, um, he was wiser than anybody else. But his wisdom, unfortunately, led him into some strange, uh, strange places. Um, Let's not get into it now. <laughs> it's not available. We don't talk about other people's failings and so on. Um, all right. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? All right. Again, um, I, I forgot I should have done this at the beginning of the lesson. Uh, I just want to thank all those people who have very generously contributed um, you know, free subscription. I mean, uh, for a subscription, there's no real subscription to get into the classes, but there are people who like to um, contribute and help, and uh, it's much appreciated, uh, all of you. Um, you're welcome, Miriam. Um, so uh, I do appreciate it, even if I don't always answer you personally, but uh, much appreciated, and uh, they do help to keep these classes going. So uh, I should provide that link again, the link to... Uh, all right. Oh, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, okay. There's various ways of donating here. There's, there's very various ways. Um, the easiest way for me is this way. Uh, just Cash App. Cash App is the easiest. Venmo is also not, not, not too difficult. Or via PayPal. Uh, decoded at gmail. Um, there. Or 
uh, if anyone wants a tax deduction, let me see if I have, let me just quickly open that document there. Ba -ba 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 -bum. All right, here we go. If you want a tax deductible donation, then you have to go to this PayPal link and ba -ba -ba. those are the first ones. And then here, if anyone wants to um, just make it out, it's to Rabanut NFP, not for profit. And that's the purple link for that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much. See you. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow night, we are, uh, there's another class tomorrow night, same time, same time, same place. Um, and we're going to continue with our discussion that we started over there, the discussion of Dvekut, the concept of Dvekut. Um, I think we'll call the class, we're, 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 let's, I think it's enough for today. And um, see you tomorrow night. If there are any more questions, I'll be happy to answer them. You're welcome, Vivian, and everybody. All righty, see you all. And uh, those who I don't see until next week, have a great week. And again, anyone who wants to send a message to the Balshem Tov, please send it sooner rather than later. All the best and have a great night. Thank you, thank you too. Okay, end.